they've been using words like soul and soulfulness, etc., <clears throat> a little bit. And so let's uh, take some time in this talk and the next few talks um, to explore a little bit what uh, those words might mean for us, um, uh, what they might mean for our practice and for our way of conceiving of Dharma and the relationship between those kinds of concepts and, and the Dharma and fill all that out a little bit, open it up a little bit rather than fill it out, open it up for exploration. So probably most people when they hear the word soul uh, tend to immediately <coughs> conceive, in, in most instances depending on how it's used, but um, tend to immediately conceive some kind of entity, the soul, a soul, uh, some thing which may not be material, but some kind of entity. And of course then some people, and especially some Buddhists, um, would immediately jump up and say that's uh, a protest about that, it's not okay um, to believe in such an entity or, or something like that. Uh, if we just slow down a little bit, um, even if one was using the word soul <coughs> as uh, indicating some kind of entity, even if even even if one was doing that, it would still be, I would hope, the understanding that 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 entity is empty, is empty of inherent existence, and knowing that, it's then okay to talk in those terms and to use the concept or the experience of that entity just as uh, Buddhists talk uh, in the language of self and feel the self and conceive of the self and knowing uh, either through experience or knowing just through doctrine that it's empty, it's empty of inherent existence, this self. But it doesn't stop us talking about it and relating to it and even having practices that are framed and directed uh, in terms of and at the self. And just as we uh, talk about and practice and think of uh, and receive teachings about things like the five aggregates, body <coughs> and uh, feeling and perception and mental formations and consciousness, these two are empty. They are not non-empty. They do not really exist. They are entities that are empty. And we talk about them, we practice with them, and we practice ways of looking that see them and, and regard them in certain ways. And the processes also that the, the aggregates um, are, uh, are fundamental to, those processes are not real. The elements of the processes, the aggregates, the psychophysical constituents are entities, and the processes are, I suppose, a kind of entity in, in some sense. Empty, 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 empty entities. So this is really important not to jump on words like soul, uh, because one understands if one uses it with the flavor of an entity at times, that entity is always understood to be empty, just as self is understood to be empty, and we use that word just as the aggregates, just as the process, all the rest of it. But actually, um, I would like to more often use a word such as soulfulness rather than soul to actually take it away from that problematic notion of an entity, although, as I just said, I don't have a problem with it, but, but rather to use more, more a word like soulfulness and also soul-making, uh, which is a word that came from the poet John Keats, I think, originally. <clears throat> soulfulness and soul-making. Soul-making, you'll notice, is an adjective. Uh, sorry, a, a verb. Uh, we, we make soul. One can make soul. Or soul is made, so to speak, soul making. What does that mean? Or soulfulness is made. So what we're really talking about, what really I want to emphasize here by sh shifting uh, the inclination a little bit and, and at times the vocabulary, what we're really talking about is ways of looking, that means ways of relating, ways of conceiving, and also ways of acting, 
in the world. Ways of, let's call all of that ways of looking, relating, conceiving, acting. Ways of looking that nourish, sustain, um, increase a sense of soulfulness. So that's what we might say soul making is. Uh, that it's the increase, the, the, the uh, growth and the fertilization and the nourishment and the support of soulfulness. And what do we mean by soulfulness? What do I mean by soulfulness? I mean that richness of resonance in the psyche that uh, involves meaningfulness. As I said, that's not the same as meaning, but meaningfulness, the pregnancy of meaningfulness, the emotional resonances that are often so subtle and so nuanced, not always, um, and, and often beautiful. The, these kind of resonances of meaningfulness, of emotion, <coughs> uh, resonances of the heart, in the heart, the heart resonating. This is part of soulfulness. But also ideas, the resonances of ideas that are, uh, uh, as I say, resonating or, or quivering with or triggered by or opened by or associated with whatever is um, uh, feeding for us that sense of soulfulness. And remember, this word idea is related to the Greek word eidos, E-I-D-O-S, and also includes then how we conceive and how we see, eidos, how we look. Um, so that also is a part of, wrapped up in, in the whole sort of rich, fertile complex of what soulfulness is. Um, resonances with ideas and also informing and shaping and directing and giving depth to the, to the way we look and see and conceive. All this is wrapped up. In fact, depth as a whole is characteristic of soulfulness, I, I would say. <clears throat> um, beauty also is very uh, 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 wrapped up in or, or characteristic of, of soulfulness. And, and as we said before, the range of beauty um, grows. So the heart, the, the being, the psyche, the eyes, the sensibility expanding its range of beauty as the soulfulness grows with the soulfulness. Beauty is a, a dimension, an aspect of soulfulness, of soul and soul making. And with all this importance, a sense of something being important is also central to, to a sense of soulfulness. So much so that uh, we could say that what is soul making or when there's a sense of softness there is um, at those times uh, a certain relationship with death in the sense that things um, what is soul making gives us a sense of uh, deep importance almost of this thing is uh, in, in some way transcends is the wrong word but echoes beyond, casts its uh, image beyond my uh, mortal span. Into death we see life, uh, sub specie eternatis, in other words, from the perspective of eternity, from perspective of beyond our death. When things are deeply soulful, they have that kind of resonance uh, beyond beyond our life and, and they frame, they form, they shape and deepen our relationship with death and with our own death. And not in terms of belief, I'll come back to this. Soulfulness also, soul making also has to do with um, seeing images, um, in the seeing or sensing images, let's say, but also with seeing life or seeing this or that experience or event or myself or my trajectory in life, my unfolding as image. So this seeing as image is also very, a very, very um, central um, uh, characteristic of, of soul making. Uh, love, also we've touched on this and we'll return to this, how much d different kinds of love uh, are very much part of soul making and gives soulfulness different flavors with, with that kinds of love. And again, necessity, again, that's something we'll return to, um, a sense of the necessity of this experience, this unfolding, this image, whatever it is, when it has that characteristic, that feel, that sense of soulfulness. So all of that 
is and more probably is is what what I'm trying to get to when I when I use that word soulfulness, and we're either nourishing it or not. It's either being made that soulfulness, soul making, uh, supported or or uh, less so. Now we could say, and actually it would be very wise to say, soul is undefinable. It's one of those sort of uh, what sometimes people call root metaphors, and as such, it's it's undefinable. There will be a wisdom in keeping a sense of um, flexibility and plasticity uh, and range in in how we use that word. I think that's very very wise and helpful. And so just saying it's undefinable. Um, and at the same time, we could say, for our purposes, that soul is those ways of looking, those ways of relating and conceiving and acting that, as I said, nourish, fertilize, deepen, enrich, and support a, a sense of soulfulness, a palpable sense of soulfulness. So we can say soul is undefinable. We can also define soul as, rather than as an entity, as as a whole range of ways of looking that feed soulfulness. Now that definition may sound circular, but in in a way it doesn't matter. It's uh, it's leading us somewhere uh, potentially. <clears throat> so. As an example of a, a non-soulful um, imagining or image, um, someone told me ages ago, it was actually a, a, another teacher, um, they were on a meditation retreat at the retreat center where they worked uh, and had a senior position, and um, this is a, ages ago, and they were meditating in a room on their own, and the heating pipes were sort of um, making noises that heating pipes do. And they were meditating and hearing the, the sound of the pipes and then began to hear voices um, sort of from in and from the sounds of the heating pipes as they were on. Um, and heard those voices and started to listen closer and thought they heard another teacher and a friend discussing some problem with the retreat center. Uh, I can't even remember what it was. And um, as if in secret. So he thought in that moment that he could hear their voices in another room being carried um, to him through the heating pipes. Um, and even at one point they said, well, don't don't tell him, this, this, the meditator, the, the other teacher, um, as if they were trying to keep it secret. Um, now, actually, that's more an instance of probably something like hallucination and delusion. Um, it often comes, actually, when the concentration is too narrow, too tight, with too much energy, and it's what we call a, a kind of yogi mind uh, manifestation. It's one of the manifestations of what we call yogi mind. There is, in, in that kind of imagining, there is no soulfulness. There is no uh, recognition, oh, this is an image. It's, it's totally concretized. He thought he was listening to an actual fact, an actual situation, a uh, concrete situation that was happening in real time, in another room, etc. There's nothing poetic there. Uh, so very, very different uh, thing there. There's, there. There was no soulfulness in that sense there. Um, now, we all know maybe that kind of thing, certainly, but we also all know uh, papancha, this Pali word, P-A-P-A-N-C-A, -A -A, this kind of craziness of the mind, ego proliferation, proliferation, the, the spinning of the mind, like, like uh, a, a dog that's got hold of a bone and just, or chasing its own tail, just spinning and creating... Um, a mess of suffering and self-building and all that. So all human beings know that to some degree or other. Um, and we can certainly say that is different than soul making. Um, we uh, really want to get the sense these are two different things. Soul making and papancha are different, even though papancha might involve imagination and fantasy and, and, um, and all that. In papancha, there are some of the differences between papancha and soul making. It, it are, include the fact that in papancha, um, it's usually about ego reactivity as the dominant thing. The ego is very tight and caught up in its reactivities. 
So if it involves someone else, we're trying to, in, in the Papancha states, trying to be a, get one up on this person or get some kind of revenge or something. It's so narrow in, its, um, in, in the vortex there. The self-view when there's Papancha is completely um, literal. Um, I just believe what I am thinking or how I am viewing the self. I believe that is the truth about myself in that moment. And if it's that I'm an idiot or I'm a failure or I'm ugly or whatever it is, a useless meditator, that's what I'm believing. And that self-view is also very, very central and um, uh, uh, in, in what's going on in Papancha. It all revolves around self-view, Papancha, in contrast with um, soul-making, where it does not actually, the self-view is not literal, um, it's not to do with ego reactivity so much at all. There's not the centrality of, of the self and the self-view. Self-view is not being grasped at. There is not a preoccupation with self-view that characterizes Papancha. Uh, all that's um, m much, much looser and more spacious and more kind of see-through um, uh, in, in, in soul-making. Um, in Papancha, we do not see. This is image. This is fantasy. There's not that recognition. There is not in Papancha a kind of um, diaphanous quality either to what is seen or the self or the image of the self. No light shines through that. There's no sense of something coming through um, that's perhaps divine or, 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 or of another dimension, if you like, of depth, etc., um, there's not much beauty in Papancha. We're just in this vortex, tightly spinning uh, and, and contracted, um, as opposed to the openness and the harmonization of energies and the sense of meaningfulness that characterize soul making. So there's quite a difference um, between soul making and you use of images versus papancha or hallucinations or delusions, that kind of thing. Now, we've said this before, but it's so important I want to emphasize it again. Soul making um, happens or, or is, exists in relationship with images or experiences. Soul making is in the relationship or in the conscious working with images and experiences. Um, and that relationship, that conscious working includes the conceptual framework. So soul making is in the relationship, is in the conscious working with an image or an experience or images or experiences, not in the images or the fantasies alone. So that's, that's again helpful to, to have it as a verb, soul making. It's in the working with, rather than it exists inherently, independently in this image. So that, that's really important. Now we could just leave it at that. We could go a step further, and in a way it's a tangent now. I'll come back to this perhaps in later talks, I hope. Um, but, but, but we could say then, okay, we've just said soul making is in the relationship, in the conscious working with, not in the images alone. Well, we could say that soul is that which views in ways that increase soulfulness, that, that feed and nourish and deepen soulfulness. So we could say that soul is that which, or that entity which, if, if you want to lose, use that term loosely, soul is that which views in ways, ways of looking, that um, nourish, increase, deepen, uh, etc., soulfulness. Now compare that kind of uh, definition with, uh, let's say, in the Kabbalistic tradition of, of Jewish mysticism, where the soul, the human soul and the mind, are regarded as fundamentally not separate from the divine. So there's that entity that's not separate from the divine and the divine perception. And therefore, because of this not se non-separateness, um, the human uh, soul and mind and psyche um, is kind of authorized because it's not separate from the divine. It's kind of there's an, there's it's authorized and facilitated in its interpretations both of holy texts 
And this is this openness of interpretation that we were talking about before, this infinite interpretive possibility, and in terms of life and the world, and others and self. So because the mind, the soul, is not separate from the divine, it gives uh, the human range of interpretation, authority and, um, and, and uh, facility. It's, it's actually helped because of the, the, well, the having its roots in the divine. The soul, in this definition, soul is that which views in ways that increase soulfulness. So these kinds of interpretation, these kinds of ways of looking at texts or tradition or um, life or self or the world uh, are, are building soulfulness. In the Buddhist tradition, there's this teaching of Buddha nature in, in the Mahayana and the Vajrayana traditions. Now that teaching of Buddha nature gets interpreted in different ways in different directions. Some people just interpret it as just saying, well, the mind is uh, impermanent. There's nothing that's permanent there, and there's no sort of fixed essence to it, in which case it's sort of infinitely shapeable. So we have um, a, a Buddha potential. We have a potential, because there's nothing fixed in the mind and it's all impermanent, that it can change and be shaped eventually into, into, the, uh, into a Buddha mind consciousness. So sometimes that's the interpretation of Buddha nature. Other times Buddha nature is more seen as, um, if you like, a primordial wisdom awareness that exists already within us but is kind of covered up. And again, similar to the Kabbalistic interpretation, this primordial wisdom awareness already sees things as divine and empty at the same time. It sees self and other and beings and this world and materiality and the whole cosmos as divine manifestations, um, empty divine manifestations. Uh, so without concretizing and giving them this kind of independent existence. So that's what Buddhas know. That's how Buddhas see in, in the Vajrayana tradition. And this Seeing this primordial wisdom, wisdom awareness exists within us, within everybody, within every sentient creature, but it's covered over. In that context, tantric practice is actually, or a large part of tantric practice, is actually, if you like, skillfully mimicking this vision of a Buddha, this ultimate primordial wisdom awareness. And one sort of... Um, if you like, fakes it till you make it. You practice seeing in that way, seeing how a Buddha sees, seeing empty divinity everywhere and in everything. So again, uh, relating it, it's not exactly the same, but soul, Buddha nature, is that which views in ways that um, nourish, deepen, enrich, and heighten uh, and support soulfulness. Or, in a more modern uh, context of more, uh, some modern um, psychotherapies, Jungian and post-Jungian, etc., you say the mind or the psyche is imbued with um, archetypes and gods. They're part of uh, the, the deep uh, essence, if you like, or fabric of, of the mind. The mind or the psyche is rooted, if you like, in the archetypes and uh, the gods in that way. And again, the, these archetypes then um, we see through the lenses, if you like, or possessed, if you like, by different archetypes, different gods, and they see in ways that, um, again, increase, fertilize, nourish, enrich, deepen, heighten, support soulfulness. So there's quite a few different um, <clears throat> traditions that, that in some way or other echo each other here by, by saying something like soul is that which views in ways that increase, uh, etc., soulfulness. But if that's too much, and we will return to those kind of ideas, I hope, later in the retreat, but if that's too much, let's just say Soul making, what I said before, soul making is in relationship with images and experiences, and uh, not in the images and the fantasies alone. It's in relationship with the conscious working with, uh, which includes the conceptual frameworks, um, the conscious working with the relationship with images and experiences. It's in that relating. That's why we, we, we use it as a verb. Now let's, let's go into this a little more. I've said, and I really 
want to make this so so uh, fundamental to the whole <coughs> um, sort of structure that's supporting this whole investigation. I've said and I repeat now, what what is Dharma practice? Or how can we see Dharma practice in a way that ends up being, let's say, most fertile, uh, opens up the most possibility? I would say, what is Dharma practice? Dharma practice is the practice of many and varied ways of looking. And again, that, that phrase, ways of looking, includes conceptual framework and relationship, etc., and ways of acting. Dharma, Dharma and Dharma practice is the practice of a whole range, the development of skill and flexibility and facility uh, and range um, of, of, of a range of ways of looking. Now, it seems to me that any, <clears throat> any conception of the Dharma that doesn't open up to a range that wants to either explicitly or implicitly um, make Dharma a practice of just this way of looking or just this way of conceiving, when it wants to shrink it down like that, away from opening up this range and this flexibility of many, many ways of looking. Um, anyone that tends towards singularity implicitly or explicitly, I I think we'll, we'll quite quickly run into either philosophical problems or dead ends, ethical problems or dead ends, or uh, dead ends in, in practice and, and perception. Um, that's a whole other subject. But, but let's say this. Dharma practice is the practice of many different ways of looking and the development of that skill and range and facility. Now, within that, we could delineate three broad possibilities possibilities or three camps of ways of looking if you like the first is actually the the one that most people are most familiar with and what's uh, the so-called bare attention it's not a phrase the buddha ever used uh, what's come to be known as bare attention or something like that and so we could say that sort of thing that kind of simple mindfulness what's come to be regarded that way is is one one strand now actually um, in a way it's a misnomer it's a it's a uh, it's a helpful tool to think about bare attention that we can actually be with things directly barely um, etc in that kind of strict way uh, as if that were really possible it's not because that kind of looking still includes all kinds of um, assumptions and conceptions wrapped up in in a perceiving in a mode of perceiving a way of looking that seems very bare compared to our usual um, way ways of looking but it's actually not bare nevertheless it's a valid and helpful way of practicing. So one possibility is bare attention, one, one um, avenue or, or, or camp, if you like. But then there, as a second uh, of these broad possibilities of, of, of the groups of ways of looking, is a whole range of practices that, if you like, fabricate um, much less than bare attention fabricates. So when we're in the mode of bare attention of simple mindfulness, we really can have the sense as practitioners, oh, I'm not fabricating so much right now. There is not so much being fabricated in terms of papancha and story and concepts. So there's a degree of less fabrication in the mode of, mode of bare attention. But then, as I said, there are a whole range of practices in this second broad, poss broad range of possibility that fabricate much, much less than bare attention, much less. So as the samadhi deepens, as the metta deepens, or compassion practices, certainly emptiness practices go way, way deeper in terms of fabricating less perception. Um, so that the whole well fabric of perception begins to deconstruct, things become start to become much less substantial. This is a spectrum here, much less substantial, and then they start not appearing. Uh, this or that element of perception of sensation just not appearing all the way down to the total non-appearance of any perception, any sensation, any appearance or experience at all. So there's a range of decreasing fabrication that one can, again, if one's practicing in the right way and thinking of practice the right way, um, develop that journey into less and less fabrication. There's a whole range of practices there. So that would be the second camp. So you've got bare attention, as a, as, a, as a mode, if you like, or an idea, um, this 
decreasing fabrication, a whole range of practices that decrease fabrication. And then the third possibility is you actually got fabrication that we can skillfully fabricate. We can fabricate self and other and the perception of self and other as this or that, the, the whole world um, around us and objects and all that, and fabricate in different ways and lots of different colors, if you like, to that fabrication and directions within that. So there's bare attention, um, a decrease in fabrication, and fabrication. Three broad possibilities um, it, it, to, to span the, uh, the, the, the break up or make up that range of ways of looking. And lots and lots of modes in there, except the bare attention, which is a more sort of singular type of practice. Now, we cannot live in bare attention. You can try, but we cannot live in bare attention. We cannot live a life without fantasy. And I'm using that word in its uh, beautiful sense, fantasy, on this retreat, mostly. We cannot live in bare attention. We cannot live without fantasy and without um, a kind of cosmology, if you like, a sense of um, what this cosmos is in which we seem to be existing. So fantasy, cosmology give structure, direction and meaningfulness to self and the world, the cosmos. So we can have periods when we're in the mode of bare attention in that possible, in that possibility, that avenue, but I cannot live my life that way. So there's all kinds of um, very important uh, aspects to, to that statement and sort of um, implications of that statement and, and uh, places where it's or, or roots or origins of, of, of where where such a statement or idea that we even could live that way come from. For example, in the scientific revolution, the 16th and 17th centuries, this gradual change in human um, conception of um, the world that took place, centered in Europe in, in the 16th, 17th centuries. And with that came the, the elevation and the dominance, slowly, of the idea of being able to know reality in an objective way, um, removing the subject and the influence of the subject um, from the perception of reality and the world and materiality, etc., or even other other humans or society, etc., and knowing them, the, pos the idea that we can know them objectively if we take ourselves and our um, uh, distortions out of the picture. And with that, again, came the elevation, the dominance of measurement as the uh, dominance of paradigm and, and way of knowing. Uh, many of you will know, of course, this, this um, idea of objectivity and the absolute possibility of measurement got then uh, grew and grew and grew and got more and more, but then actually sort of came back round on itself and began cracking its own structure with um, uh, modern physics about 100 years ago, relativity and particularly with, with quantum mechanics, the whole idea of being able to be absolutely objective um, sort of uh, cracked. But anyway, with the scientific revolution, there was, to borrow a um, phrase from Richard Tarnas, um, all this brought about in, in the wider consciousness, the collective psyche, a sense of the ontological diminution. What he really means is the uh, sense that certain aspects of human experience um, became less real or were seen to be less real. Ont ontological diminution of things like emotion um, or aesthetics, the aesthetic aspect, the emotional aspect of human experience, these were sort of became second class or second tier aspects of, um, of reality. They, they were seen as less real. The ethical dimension, the imaginative, the intentional. Now this is actually crucial because these aspects, the emotional, the aesthetic, the ethical, the imaginative, the intentional, etc., these are actually, if you like, the most human aspects of, of our experience. 
more recently people some psychologists think oh well you can measure emotion by brain response or skin gal galvanic response or whatever it is or you can get people to fill out questionnaires and then rate their answers scale of one to ten and therefore it's brought in again but this is pretty weak that way in terms of the uh, richness that's available to us so those aspects that in a way make us most human uh, that are so central and so rich to our to our experience of being human were actually slowly um, relativized and, and seen as less real than materiality and things that we could measure and things that were uh, more so-called objective. And with that, with all that, uh, what happened to the sense of meaningfulness in life and meaningfulness in the cosmos? Um, it also got... Uh, undermined, radically undermined with all that. And this is the culture that we have, the cultural paradigm and, and, and um, dominant view that we've, we've absorbed. But we need, as human beings, we need conceptual frameworks and fantasies that engage us and enchant us, that um, our soul making. We need soul making, and and that involves conceptual frames of fantasies that engage and enchant us. That's what the soul or psyche or the human being needs. Part of the human being needs, we could say. So there's a lot to say about this. I mean, recently I've been um, uh, having a lot of hospital visits in and out and lots of tests and this and that and talking to doctors about test results and things like that and with all that um, uh, facing the possibility of pos possible death not in the not too distant future etc and interesting going into these environments uh, and, and, and the modern medical system and hospitals which are so wonderful in terms of um, what they're able to offer and make possible for human beings these days. But actually in relation to soul, um, quite interesting re reflecting or, or seeing them through the lens of what is and isn't soul making. So soul and soulfulness, as I said, um, has there's a special relationship with death. Soul and death go together. Um, the sense of soul and life and death. The, these these the sense of life and death um, is central to soul. And entering into the modern medical system in the West, how wonderful it is. In a way, there's a lot of talk about statistics and survival statistics and long-term survival statistics and biology and matter and, in a way, really treating the human organism as a machine um, whose functioning we want to uh, kind of keep ticking over and whose functioning we want to optimize or minimize the damage of, all of which is great. But what happens to soul when that is the only conversation going on? What happens to soulfulness? What happens when there's no space around um, those conversations, which are important and, and of course are useful, but what happens when that those conversations about machine function and statistics of survival, etc., and risk factors and all that, and um, material, bio biological facts. What happens when that's the only conversation it takes up all the time and all the space? And one looks around the hospital, again, wonderful environments, and um, so um, lacking in soulfulness or attention to soulfulness as a key element. Um, there may be a chapel, a small room there, but other than that, not. It's designed for functionality in terms of the biological machine. So what happens to soulfulness? If I, if I were, or one were to bring that up um, to, let's say, the board of directors of a hospital or whatever, they might assume that one means, um, oh, beliefs, the different beliefs that human beings have about um, what happens to them after they die, because they might die in hospital or they might be facing death. And so how can we address those beliefs and, uh, or something like that? So that's very quickly the assumption around these kind of words and uh, conversations. But I'm not really talking about belief. And I'm, not, I'm really not talking about belief, I should say. Um, 
I'm talking about perception and experience and appearance here and now of self, of other, and of world. Um, and wrapped up in that is um, is a sense of death, but not a, a belief about this or that happen after, after death or doesn't happen or this or that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about perception, experience, ways of looking that are soul-making here and now and of the here and now. And it's complicated. I don't, I don't necessarily have an answer to this at all um, because unlike several hundred years ago, let's say, <clears throat> um, when everyone was Christian and even before everyone was Catholic, um, um, nowadays the range of what gives rise to soulfulness, what is soul-making, is, is enormous in society. So for different people, what would need to be there in a hospital or, or through the medical system um, to offer the possibility of soul making for, for each person is it's a huge range. For some people it would be a religious belief perhaps or religious context. Other people it's more I just really want to spend time with my family. The close circle of human relationships in this life etc. have become what is soulful. And there's a whole range there. So, just an observation, really. I don't really know what the answer is there. At least I can't think of one right now. Um, but it's an, to me, it's interesting. As a culture, we are um, lost, really. Or we have lost any even hint of a direction culturally of where to find soulfulness again, how we can um, revivify that, re-engage that, find the threads that nourish and, and our soul making. As a culture, we almost don't even know where to look and wouldn't even know where to begin to look. So this, this has all kinds of impacts, uh, all kinds of directions of impacts, this whole question of soulfulness and what gets lost from our life and our view when we jettison it and cut it off. And that can happen in relation to practice as well, of course, as I said. So I and um, many of my friends uh, who, who, whose practice goes back many decades, um, or a few decades at least, um, know that it's possible to try and live as if one is just being trying to be mindful all the time, trying to almost live in bare attention. But that gets so much emphasis and gets set up as a sort of possibility of this is what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to live in bare attention. And if one really, really loves mindfulness and really loves practice and one goes for that, one will find a kind of aliveness that comes into one's life. It, does, it will make one, or aspects of one, dimensions of one's existence very, feel very alive. There will be a kind of radiance that comes in to the sense of things. And there will be a decrease in suffering to some degree. But I know, uh, and many people have told me, trying that and then, and then feeling, as someone said to me not too long ago, um, I feel neutered, was the word she used. I've been practicing mindfulness with all my heart and I feel neutered after these years. Or someone else, close friend, said she felt like something in her soul was dying. She didn't quite recognize, what, at the very same time as something felt very alive, something, a dimension, a very important dimension, the soul dimension, was being killed or neglected. All kinds of... Um, uh, implications and uh, problems, limitations come out of that, can come out of that. So we can try to live in, in bare attention, try to pr make my whole life a practice of mindfulness and bare attention, but the soul making actually will come then around practice around the whole notion of the path, the whole I fantasy of a, a, an idea of what, who the Buddha was and what he is or was. The whole, it will come around all that, around the tradition and around the self um, uh, as the person walking the path or, 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 or in the lineage of this tradition. 
So I can try to be mindful as much of the time, and yet still the soul making will come in because it's because it's what the soul does, and it will come in around practice. If my practice is just mindfulness and this kind of shaving off of soulfulness, because that's what the bare attention does, just as when there's less fabrication in those moments, there will be um, l- l- less soul making. It's only in the fabrication of those three broad possibilities that there's the possibility of soul making, really. But if we're practicing just mindfulness, then the soul making comes around, around practice, path, Buddha, tradition, self, etc., as fantasy, as mythos. So even in the, in the time of the Buddha in the Pali Canon, um, out of their meditation, the monks and the nuns would have had this whole fantasy, mythos, conceptual framework of um, awakening as the end of rebirth, etc. And that was the trajectory, the journey, the noble path that they were on. This whole fantasy and mythos about the Buddha and the um, fortune of living in the time of the Buddha as this sort of once in an eon manifestation, etc. Uh, in Theravada Buddhism. And it still enters, the soul making still enters in relation to practice and dharma around practice if the practice is very narrow and not and the practice itself is not so soul making. It will come around it. And that is not a problem. It's more just something to really recognize and observe and know this is happening. It's not a problem. It's not that we uh, we are engaged in soul making when we can't handle reality. We conjure fantasies and mythoi and, and images when we can't handle it's not it's not like that. It's simply how the psyche works, how the soul works. Through image, through fantasy, through mythos, it it um, creates souls. There's soul making, there is the nourishing of soulfulness. So you can see this in all kinds of things. For example, food. In relationship to food, what are the fantasies that get woven in to relationship with food? Really interesting. Um, cooking shows seem so popular these days on TV, and and uh, sometimes I find even some of the coordinators spending an evening reading cooking. It's not because they have to cook the next day; they're just interested in in these cookbooks and fantastic pictures and such sensuality in the pictures. And this, what's the fantasy? Not not this is not a criticism, but what kind of fantasies get wrapped up in food? So sometimes it's the fantasy of nature and connection with nature. Um, sometimes it's uh, it's that richness or the good life, and that's that's wrapped up in the fantasy that's um, keeping us. Uh, if if one is into this, I'm not. But if one is into watching cooking shows or or this, that's maybe one of the fantasies. You will find some um, plenty of hardcore Buddhist practitioners. And I've been in this camp myself of just regarding food as fuel. Then that becomes a fantasy. It looks like it's not a fantasy. It looks like it's shaved off. I let go of all fantasy and papancha around food. It's just fuel. But wrapped up with seeing food as just fuel is a renunciate fantasy, and that the way. Um, people can fall in love with renunciation and the path of renunciation, the simplicity of it, the surrender of it, the the stripping bare of it. And again, that may be tied in with the whole conceptual framework of the Four Noble Truths as um, transcending, clinging, or or letting go of clinging, etc. So this fantasy and conceptual framework uh, wrapped up in 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 the idea or the viewing of food as fuel. Or the whole thing that's brought to, to, to food might be about mindfulness, and you get this a lot on retreats in retreat centers. And then the fantasy, uh, the mindfulness fantasy in relation to food is about tasting the moment, perhaps, or a tasting life, literally tasting life. Um, but also in its broader meaning of tasting. Uh, or it might be, and for so many people, um, their their sense of mindfulness and presence, their fantasy that's woven into um, mindfulness, their their practice of mindfulness and presence has to do with nature, nature, and their love of nature and what nature is, and interconnectedness and all that's all wrapped up in there as well. Or again, if the mindfulness is the main thing in relation to food, 
um, mindfulness of taste, etc., mindfulness of greed. It's all, it's plugged into a more renunciate uh, fantasy and a more renunciate framework that has to do with um, transcending clinging, transcending this world, and attachment to materiality, attachment to sense pleasure, perhaps even attachment to manifestation, not being reborn again. Or there is, a, there could be a, a food fantasy. This would probably be a lot more conscious and deliberate in a lot of cases, as food as the nectar of the gods, or if a slightly darker image spin, the blood or the body of the gods. And one can actually practice that as as a as an image, as a fantasy in relation to food. But it will come in. One way or another, in relation to something like food, there's there's going to often when it when it's alive for us, when we're interested and and, and there's connection there, um, the fantasy comes in. A fantasy comes in. Which one is it? So this fan- fantasy, the mythoi images, the psyche and the soul need that. They need soul making, and they do it through image, mythos, fantasy. And wrapped up in all this, and we've touched on this before, is the whole question about reality. And is this a delusion, or is going away from reality and not being connected with reality? All, all that stuff that comes up for people as a sort of um, sort of philosophical objection. But understanding emptiness can be really helpful here. Deep understanding of emptiness. This journey into um, really practicing ways that really decrease fabrication in the moment. So there's a dissolution, uh, a loss of substantiality, and then a dissolution of all appearances. That whole spectrum, journeying on that spectrum and then coming up and realizing what that more and less fabrication is dependent on how things get fabricated. Understand, all these appearances are empty. I'm not trying to live in in a state of non-fabrication. I could not anyway, or a state of less fabrication. But see, going up and down that spectrum of fabrication, understanding it, I understand the emptiness of all appearances. And that frees fabrication. It frees me uh, to fabricate. It gives license and permission and beauty to the play and the playing with fabrication, to soul making. So it frees up fabrication, including the imagination. Because very often someone would say, soul making, fantasy, that's, that's fabrication with the sense of that's, that's just not true. It's real. It's a lie. It's fabrication. But once I understand emptiness deeply enough through practice, through practice, I really understand all experiences are fabricated. All appearances are fabricated. There are none that are not. And that frees up this whole investigation into soul and image and imagination and fantasy. And it's not quite that simple. It's not that all... uh, Appearances are fabricated in the same way or have the same kind of um, conventional reality. But it can go a long way to freeing up the the permission and the avenues to explore um, fabricating in different ways, including the whole range with with image. Now I'd like to add to, uh, to our sort of meaning of soul making or maybe say it's characteristic of it. let's let's add it this realization knowing that this is image this is fantasy so there's an awareness knowing image as image that and i say i, I want to say that's part um i don't think it's what everyone includes in their definition of soul making people use that word which is not that many but um but let's include it in ours there's a recognition that this is image this is fancy and no image as image and even more than that there's a, a, a flexibility around conceptual frameworks and views we're not landing on one and reifying it saying this is the truth this way of seeing things this way of seeing images or this way of seeing life this way of seeing um this is real so included in what i want to call soul making is this flexibility and skill and and being able to move between different views that's a really um really really helpful it's a desired um uh, attribute, capacity, skill. 
Now that flexibility in regard to conceptual frameworks might come through emptiness practice itself as it goes deeper and deeper. It might come through imaginal practice uh, too, interestingly, or both emptiness and imaginal practice. It might also come for some people through more um, modern philosophical um, investigations, postmodernism, poststructuralism, and that sort of thing. Um, but it can come in different ways or a combination. And and some people are already just able to do that. They're very loose and flexible in how they view in, in how they hold conceptual frameworks. Very able to move in in and out of different ones, even if they seem contradictory. And it might be, I often wonder, it might be that some people may never be able to do that. Um, they they will never, for whatever reasons, they will never. It could be that some people just won't ever be able to have that flexibility of conceptual frameworks. And their whole way of looking um, is regard is just regarding things as concrete. It either is or it isn't. It's either this or it's that, um, etc. It may be that some people just don't have, will never be able to stretch and open that way. Just as it says in the Mahayana tradition, some people will never be able to understand emptiness deeply. And so one should be careful who one teaches it to. It may be the same around all, all this stuff. I'm not sure. But if we uh, take this as part of what, what we mean here for, for our purposes, this flexibility um, and ability to move between different conceptual frameworks and to entertain them without locking down on this or that as true or the only truth or, or reality, if we, have, if, we, if we include that, then part of what we're entertaining um, in terms of soulfulness, in terms of what is soul making, the concept, part of the conceptual frameworks that we're entertaining that give rise to and support and nourish soulfulness, we could go through um, aspects of that, of what we're entertaining. There is the idea, the idos that we're entertaining of the necessity of this image um, that that uh, that is meaningful to me, that's uh, resonant for me. That sense of the necessity of this image, that um, entertaining the idea of the necessity of this image, that's part of soulfulness. It's part of the soulfulness there. And again, to repeat what we've already said, I can sense that necessity, but I'm also acknowledging that it's given to the image through my way of looking, through my way of conceiving. So certainly I have that experience of it being sensed as necessary, but I know also that it's given. And necessity doesn't imply, um, oh, this image is necessary, therefore it's the only image or the only fantasy for me. It doesn't imply a kind of singularity. So with respect to the self um, and soul-making, um, there is really this also the idea, the idos of opening up a sense of a multiplicity of fantasies, of mythoi, of imaginal figures and characters. That multiplicity is very much... Um, a, a, an aspect of soul making and soulfulness and soul. And also the idea, the idos of uh, a certain autonomy that these imaginal figures, these archetypes, these gods have. That's also very much uh, a part, an aspect, a necessary ingredient of soul making. So we are not regarding them as factors or essential qualities of, of the, the, the self or, or the psyche or whatever. Uh, an imaginal figure is a person, in some sense, equal to the self. It's not a constituent of the self. It's not a part of the self to be somehow integrated to this Exec chief executive self that will then make decisions and balance everything and navigate successfully through life in a balanced way or whatever. And awakening then is not so much a process of, say, collecting the whole set of these con constituent sort of figures or qualities or whatever and having them um, uh, together the full set in a balanced way without any conflict between different um, characters figures or aspects of, of qualities. It's not, uh, it, it, we can open up the sense of awakening to even include the possibility that sometimes these figures make impossible and unreasonable demands of us and our lives, 
we're going to come back to that whole question. But that's a very different image of awakening. Not as necessarily balanced in the way that we might think, not as um, completely lacking in a contradiction or conflict, not as um, uh, you know devoid of um, unreasonable and impossible demands on the self coming from, let's say, the depths of the soul or the wider psyche, these imaginal figures. So all this means that perhaps there are multiple styles, if you like, of awakening or directions of awakening. I've talked about this in other talks, so I won't say too much. But the views open, the view opens in relation to all that, perhaps. And then also uh, we're entertaining the idea um, or an idea entertained that's really um, helpful and really opens up the sense of soul making and soulfulness is that the human being is in the psyche or in the soul rather than the other way around that the soul or the psyche is something in the human being so that's quite radical essay in anima uh, Jung wrote in Latin essay in anima to be in the soul the human is in the psyche the soul the soul is something much bigger if you like than the human and the human's life we are in that rather than that is in us. And all of this um, has implications uh, in, in relation to the Im images and working with images and the imaginal figures that come. So when we uh, see these imaginal figures and, and, and the plurality of them, the multiplicity of them, we can see, yes, not self. They are not self. This is not self, this image. But it's a different sense. It's beyond uh, just the viewing them as anatta, as not self, in sort of more classical Buddhist sense, as a way of letting go. I see, that's not self, that's not self, this is not self, that's not self. It's a way of deep letting go, this anatta practice, anatta view, way of looking. is a way of letting go. In this way of seeing this image and that image, and that all the multiple images are not self, it's not it's not really, a, it's a way of letting go of clinging, but it's empowering and vivifying, giving life to those imaginal figures as well, through all this, all these other um, ways of fantas fantasizing with the images and the conceptual frameworks around. And again, in regards to the whole question of necessity, who wants to come through? Who? Which image wants to come? Which imaginal figure wants to come through? Who is it that acts or feels or sees this way? This is also a question, a dimension of the question in, in, that comes out of uh, seeing the necessity of these images. When we personify, when we let things uh, take form as persons or imaginal figures, there is a disidentification with that to a certain extent. But the who, who wants to come through, who sees this way, who feels this way, who acts this way, that's a different kind of who than you get in, say, the Advaita tradition when they say, who is asking this question? Who is wanting to be enlightened, etc.? There, the, the thrust of that turning the question who uh, back to the asker is, is that there is no answer or nobody really is wanting that or oneness is wanting that or whatever. Here is very much more... Um, not this dissolution into universality, no one, or oneness, or whatever it is, but actually uh, um, the letting, letting form as uh, an imaginal figure, a person with all that depth and complexity and richness, knowing also it's empty. So the who goes in a different direction. And with all this, with this seeing this is not self, but we're empowering, we're not then claiming this image as a part of the self, as I said, or claiming this image uh, to be in service of the self. Now, we could relate that way. We can regard imaginal figures and try to see them as somehow serving us, helping me with this, helping me with that, making me become more whole, more balanced, more this, more that, more successful, grow on my path, etc. It's possible. But uh, to me, a more interesting way is, is, is not regarding them that way. Um, in terms of regarding that way, there's a, there's a short passage in the Iliad, in Homer's Iliad, um, 
where it says, the Muses met Thamaris the Thracian, he was a musician, uh, and he boasted that he would win in a singing match with the Muses themselves. This angered them. The Muses were um, divinities, uh, sons of, uh, daughters of Zeus. This angered them, this boast that he, he was a better musician than them would, would win a contest. They struck him blind. This is the bit that I want. They robbed him of the divine gift of song and caused him to forget his harping. So they robbed him of the divine gift of song. In other words, there's a view there embodied in that. It's quite a striking passage, but um, but the the view that um, these gifts of the self are really belonging to the self. Or in the Dhammi, they don't belong to anyone. Here they're regarded as a divine gift. They come from the daemon. They come um, from the divine, from the archetype, if you like. They are not uh, in service to us. We may be in service to them. So it's a different view. It's a sort of 180 degree spin on uh, what we may be tempted, how we may be tempted to view these things. So we want and we need soul making. The psyche needs that. You could say the soul needs soul making. Uh, James Hillman was, um, I can't remember where this, where this was, but he was, um, he wrote about uh, reflecting on, on psychotherapy and the sort of years of psychotherapy that went before him. And he said, it, it may be that what people were coming for was not just to be loved or cured, but to be told into a soul story. So what do we want? Not just to be loved or cured, not just to be loved or cured, but to be told into a soul story. So story here, soul story is another, another word that we can use for the words I'm using, fantasy or mythos. And a soul story is not my story so much, my human story coming from my life, but rather it's a story that we're in. We are lived by the story. What does that mean? We are lived by the story. Again, this is 180 degree flip, if you like, in how we view our lives. We are lived by a story. And that doesn't necessarily mean a mythic story, um, or rather a classic, classically mythic story, but this mythic storying of life, which doesn't mean classical Greek or whatever it is, or Buddhist. The mythic storying of life. What does that mean? What would that mean for us to view our lives that way? And not in a clunky, rigid way. Everything become liquid. To use that archetypal metaphor again. We're we're entertaining a mythic storying of life, but without being too rigid about it, without viewing it in a clunky way, seeing it all as liquid. So it's poetic, it's subtle. We know image as image. And again, actually, uh, quoting James Hillman, says, to be in mythos. So what's included? What, what do we mean when we, when we uh, talk about soul story or the mythic storing of life? With this liquidity, with this sense of emptiness, he says, to be in mythos is to be inescapably linked to divine powers, archetypes, and moreover to be in mimesis with them, to to mimic them, that means. To be in mythos is to be inescapably linked to to divine powers, and moreover to be in mimesis with them. Now some people will hear that word divine and get, what on earth does that mean? And and it can make us nervous, depending on your background, inclination, etc., but there's an idea um, that actually comes from Neoplatonism and, and people like Proclus um, of epistrophe. There's a Greek word that means reversion, reverting to the archetype, the sort of primal form to, to revisit what we talked about earlier in terms of archetypes. So that our life is, a, the way, rather the way we're seeing our life is seeing them um, in relationship to these these uh, archetypes, these gods. And that's uh, a concept also in uh, that Corbin writes about in, in his explanation of the mysticism of Ibn Arabi. And there it's called Tawil in Latin, in uh, Arabic, Tawil. So epistrophe, Tawil, this sort of echoing, uh, seeing in relation to, mirroring of the image 
and also of the life mirroring the God, the archetype, or a manifestation, an appearance of God, angel, archetype, daemon. So, is it possible to open up and, and, and give life to these kind of the old ideas, um, centuries old, um, but arrive at them or, or approach them now with a much more sophisticated understanding of um, what the word real might mean? or much more open and sophisticated understanding, rather than either a naive one or what has come to be the modernist notion of reality. Can the Buddhist teaching of emptiness help us there? I think it can. What would it be to um, entertain words like divine or God or this or that, knowing that they're empty, fully empty. God is fully empty. So hopefully we're going to come back more to this. But as I said, in working with the images, we can actually sense something other, something beyond, if you like. Sometimes that's in the sense of timelessness of an image, the eternality, the non-temporality of an image. We actually sense that, again, like a poetic image. And that sense of timelessness, of something beyond, of otherness, um, that helps the image um, gather potency, be powerful, be deep for us, it gives it a sense of significance, it gives it a sense of something more than the human. So we can sense all that without needing to kind of contract around a kind of naive belief in the reality of um, some kind of concrete god figure or, or or something like that, or a concrete um, view of an angel or something like that. Maybe God is not separate from my life and the way I view my life, the way I view my duty, my journey, my acts. There's all kinds of possibilities here, but we need to open out and uh, be a little more sophisticated with our notions of reality, our philosophical notions of reality. So when we talk about story, <clears throat> we're talking about fiction. A story is a fiction, uh, generally speaking. And this, this is crucial in relation to all this. Because a fiction, a story, is actually a shapeable thing. My story, the story of my life, is not a fixed, concrete thing. Once and for all, written down, now it's gone, the past. It's shapeable. The past is shapeable. We can shape different stories, if you like, out of the same material of our lives and different soul-making. We can make different soul-making stories, if you like. And a story, so a story is a fiction. A story is also not, uh, therefore, uh, something posited as real. It's not a rational explanation. I overheard someone the other day m making a joke about... Um, uh, what was it that they were saying? Oh, of course, um, saying it's God's will would be um, equally of equal explanatory power. I was saying that was a joke because I knew that they, they didn't really mean that. Um, they were poo-pooing the whole idea of God's will. But the idea of God's will at its best is not a rational explanation. This happened because it's God's will. Oh, that, thank you, that answers my questions. No, it opens up a different dimension of relationship then with the event that's happening, with the journey that one's on, with this thing that one's looking at or relating to. It's not um, the story there, the fantasy, the, the image of that is, is not functioning, it's not even intended to function as a rational explanation. It's intended to open the soul-making in relationship with. Big difference, subtle difference, but big. Um, story, in this sense, fantasy, gives life. It is soul-making. Actually, again, um, James Hillman um, points out that story is the only mode of accounting or telling about that does not posit itself as real, true, factual, revealed, i.e. literal. So in all this, um, in, in the soul-making, uh, or rather with soul-making, uh, through images, myth, or fantasy, whether it's an, an image that appears to us or whether it's seeing our life as image, myth, fantasies, in that sense, that something is healing here. Something is healed in this way of looking, these ways of looking. Something is loosened. 
aspects are loosened. Uh, there's a there's a letting go, a loosening of self fixation. In a way, we no longer see ourselves when we see in terms of soul making as so isolated, uh, because we're connected uh, through this epistrophe, through this echoing and mirroring and rootedness in the angelic or the divine, if you like. There is this reintroduction and reconnection with the, the what I was calling the vertical dimension that hopefully I can say a bit more about as the retreat goes on. Therefore, we're not isolated and two-dimensional, one-dimensional. And in all of this, when we use words like soul-making and think more about that uh, or, or, or regard things in that way, conceive of things in that way, soul-making that takes the focus and the question away from, is this true or real? The question becomes, what is soul-making? How do I recognize that? Well, it feels a certain way, it opens up a certain way in the psyche, in the consciousness. It takes the question away from this, oftentimes too narrow, too unsophisticated um, uh, philosophical regard of, of truth and reality, and takes the question away from that into what is soul making? What nourishes, deepens, enriches, vivifies, gives depth to, gives range to soulfulness? So it's a different way of relating. It's a it's a reorienting to both to image and fantasy and to existence, self, world, other, etc.